Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Is Amanda here? Amanda, hi, Amanda. I'm still awake. You're okay. Thank you very much. She <laughs> promised to go to sleep. She thought she didn't know I was a speaker, and she said over lunch she was planning on sleeping during this session um, <laughs> <laughs> because pensions wasn't her thing. But anyway, thank you. Thank you for that support. Okay. Um, just two things before we start, really just to follow on from what uh, Rosemary said, which is this. Uh, most people, I'm pretty old, but most people here in this room under 40 have got a reason, including the men, have got a reasonable chance of making it till 90. <coughs> and that's quite a long time in retirement if you're going to retire at 60, 60, 65. And that living a long time is a problem. If you couple that with the fact that, um, I shouldn't do this, this is a, uh, I'm going to get criticised for this for, for being sexist, but I'm... Um, can I ask how many women in the room have got uh, three children or more? N nobody. One. One woman. Thank you very much. Okay. We need, as a country, forget immigration, immigration women, 2.1 children per, per childbearing woman um, to keep the population level, uh, to make sure, make sure there's enough workers to pay for the pensions of the older people. And we don't have that. The women of this country uh, are not producing uh, the, the children. <laughs> the children we need for pensions. And when Rose... When, Rose, when Rosemary said that there are problems with pensions coming on, I, don't, I want to get off the, the broad strategy thing, but there are some technical issues I want to talk about. There are big pension problems. And, and one of the big pension problems, this is um, uh, George Osborne describing the size of his pension, as it were. There are, some, uh, there, are, there are some major issues. And I just want to talk through it. There are, there are many hundred of issues. Anybody who's, who's involved in pensions day to day knows the, the, the flood of, of, of legislation, rules and regulations and things going through. We can't cover all of those. We've only got about 10, 15 minutes. Hope some questions as well. I just want to pick on three as, as indicative of the issues that are coming. These aren't the main issues, but they're three which I think are most immediate. Uh, one is the tax that's changing. I know uh, Paul Blomfield this morning talked about that. I want to uh, pick up on that. One is auto-enrolment. Uh, one of the great awful things of our time. One is contracting out. Contracting out. Uh, I was taught by a journalist uh, uh, on The Observer about 30 years ago about a subject called MEGO, M-E-G-O subjects. My eyes glaze over. But I want to talk about uh, contracting out and with two aspects. One, what, what the implications are for payroll and what the implications are for HR, so depending on which side of the fence we are. Uh, and the, idea, the object of the exercise is to make life easier. What are we actually going to do with this flood of stuff coming through? And what are the long-term implications of what's going on in pensions policy and in the government? And I want to pick up the, the final couple of slides from Rosemary, which is that the basic state pension is going up a bit from what it is now. Little, or in the next 5, 10, 15 years, it'll be around, in modern, modern money, £150 pounds a week. But even living on that is going to be a struggle for most people. And the government policies, we'll see in a minute, in relation to private pensions, I know there's a lot of talk about auto-enrollment and what we're going to do about high owners and things. The general thrust, and we'll see in March what's going to happen to the budget, the general thrust is for the government, of whichever political persuasion, not to support private pensions. And I'm going to explore about how we can work around that. So that's the background. Maybe we can have that out. Oh, in sorry. Uh, I want to show, I want to show, um, uh, can we get the sound up? Certainly yeah. have a okay. hard lot. And they want pensions of 55, though it's news that any spinster ever owned to such an advanced age. But why quibble? If they want a pension at 55, let them have it, and bachelors too. Is he getting in an early claim? But what about married men, widows, children? Let's all have pensions. The attitude of these good ladies, very earnest and rather belligerent, gives one the impression that there's a big fight in the offing. Thanks well, very that's much. Quite an yeah. I, I forgot to thank Duncan, who's, who's operating the thing there. It's a really complicated thing he's doing, and I really want to say thank you very much for organising this. Uh, this was a clip from a movie show news uh, just after the war, uh, and I just wanted to show it because it shows the diff how things change in, in, uh, in perspective about, about particularly pensions. Uh, um, we're moving into a new generation, and that was an older generation where, where the issues were slightly different, and they're about to change again. What are the changes? Well, uh, this is, I don't know if you know, this is Ros Altman. Her main thing, I don't know if you saw on the paper, this is unfair really, but, um, uh, but why not? Uh, her big thing, <laughs> her big thing, her big thing was to, she wants to change this sign, the crossing, road crossing sign, that uh, she thinks it's, uh, it's demeaning to old people. I found it quite encouraging, but anyway. Now, uh, <laughs> what, what are the tax changes? Well, we all know um, that the government is, there's a huge, a public austerity is a big issue. Uh, the Treasury, forget, forget George Osborne for a minute, the Treasury are determined in some ways to cut what they perceive as the big tax advantages of pensions. It's costing, depending on how you do the numbers, call it, call it 50 billion a year. The deficit every year in this country is roughly, these are uh, kind of fluid numbers, about 75 billion. 
So with one hit, in theory, you can't do it in practice, but in theory, you could make a big dent in the, in the, in the public uh, deficit by cancelling tax relief on pensions. And it's one of the things they are considering uh, very much. And there's a lot of comments in the press in the last few days about what, what's actually going to happen. Nobody really knows yet. But there is going to, something is going to change. And it's going to be, for most people, not good. In particular, it's not going to be good for people earning over around the 40,000 a year mark. That, that kind of number-ish. Their, their pension tax reliefs are going to be really hit. Uh, and I want to talk about uh, the higher, not higher, kind of mid earners and higher earners in a moment. The second thing that's happening, as we all know, um, is another million and a half employers are going to be sucked into the auto enrollment obligations. I just want to mention two or three things about that. In theory, the rules are being simplified. They're really complicated at the rules at the moment. They're trying to simplify them a little bit, not really very much. There are huge issues going to be over the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years in relation for payroll guys having to keep records. Uh, and I know everybody's got like, payroll systems from Sage or whatever it is. But there are going to be problems. If you don't get the proper records, uh, uh, you're going to be in serious trouble. And then the final thing is, which provider do you use? There's uh, not a lot out there, maybe a dozen or so. Uh, and some of the smaller ones, there's a huge... I'm not saying the smaller ones are bad. Some of the smaller ones are very good. But there's a, a gigantic uh, um, uh, episode of fraud going on with the smaller auto-enrollment providers. People are setting up auto-enrollment systems and just collecting the money and then disappearing in the, in the hundreds of millions of pounds. So if you're a smaller person and you don't want to go to a big operation, that's fine, but just do the due diligence on checking that they're okay. Uh, there's going to be a big scandal about it in about six months' time. Now, what about payroll? Uh, this um, is a ship belonging to uh, Carnival Lines. It's part of P&O and uh, Cunard and all the rest of it. It's one of the biggest shipping lines in the world. And they had an issue. It's really just symptomatic of an issue. Um, uh, they, they have more seamen, I think, than any other shipping line in the world. Most of the seamen are British, oddly, and most of them work out of Miami, that kind of operation. They're paid for out of a services company in Guernsey. And the pensions regulator said, these guys need to be auto-enrolled. And the company said, no, they don't, because they're nothing to do with, you know, the UK. Bit of an argument. Instead of going and having a chat with a barrister or a judge or something like that, the pensions regulator issued a compliance notice which is quite serious because if you don't comply with compliance notice, it's a criminal offence. Uh, nobody will go to prison, but in theory you might go to prison. Um, eventually the company didn't, didn't have a choice, they had to go for something called judicial review, which is a very high-powered piece of litigation in the High Court. It takes forever, it's very expensive and it's very, quite stressful. I just want to report that what happened was, the judge said that the general principles set out by the pension regulator are fine, they approved those, but in this case, they applied them wrongly and they, these guys didn't need to be auto-enrolled. And it saved a few tens of millions a year. The pensions regulator issued a press release declaiming a great triumph for the regulator. They lost. They lost. <laughs> uh, but the point is there's a lot of um, angst amongst the regulators trying to get things done. And, and the, the point of the story is that the regulators are not being neutral about this. That's the disappointing thing. And if you're running an operation and things go wrong, they are looking for scalps. And there are very heavy fines coming through, which are completely unjustified and disproportionate, but they want to do this kind of thing. And at the moment, collectively, as all of us, we can't really push back because they have the power and we do not. But you just need to bear that in mind when, when operating the, the company, we're operating through the company. Uh, so the penalties are, they're announcing more and more penalties every month. Uh, I don't want to just very touch on whether, I think I'll skip that trust or contract. There are different ways of providing uh, there are some benefits for going through a trust system rather than a contract system, uh, but I'm, I'll, I'll skip that for, for maybe, maybe there's some questions. What for HR? We're looking how many people are skipping out of auto-enrollment. That's disappointing. Uh, all those people who should be getting into, you know, who need to provide for old age. Uh, one of the things about getting in early, uh, which Robbie didn't mention, is that Einstein, it isn't true that Einstein said this, but he is said to have said that the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest. And if you put the money in early and you're allowed to compound up, even at fairly modest rates, it makes a big difference. So the earlier you can get people in, the better it is, subject to government changing the rules later on. Uh, higher earners are about to be a real, real problem for everybody in this room, all of us. I was at a, a lunch a couple of days ago, and the lady who ran a pension scheme, oddly, who knew about pensions, had just had, admittedly she's on a decent salary, but not gigantic, um, by, by lawyers, standards, <laughs> Uh, she had had a tax bill of £44,000 for that year's pension contributions. It hadn't been a contribution, she was in the DB scheme, and she had another two years' worth of uh, benefits granted to her. And the tax, the tax she had to pay was an extra £44,000, which she didn't have. And that kind of, of the higher earners is going to be an increasing bit of a problem, and how you manage that is, is hard work. 
uh, uh, I, I'm guessing you've already talked about the difference between guidance and how, do you, how you advise members and the restrictions about it. But the, the uh, financial services obligations on whether you advise um, employees or don't advise employees is really tricky. I sympathise with employees who want to run a mile from it. I know they shouldn't, but they will because the penalties for getting it wrong are just too high. Uh, and there's another rule now coming in for compliance in relation to DC schemes. I think, I'm guessing most of us know in what DC <coughs> schemes are, defined contribution schemes, new schemes. Uh, the compliance obligations are being ramped up at the moment. They used to be cheap and simple and easy, and now they're not. Uh, and we just need to know that they're there and, and expensive. A final thing, this is really dre dre dreary. Uh, there was a thing called contracting out. Contracting out's being abolished. Why do we care? We care because um, for those uh, firms that were contracted out of the second state scheme, which no longer, no longer exists, uh, there was a rebate. So you paid uh, some money to the government in national insurance, that national insurance rebate. So you're going to have to pay another 3 4% uh, to the government unless you change the terms of your own existing pension scheme. Uh, most people have got around to that, but if you haven't got around to that, your employer will be pretty miffed uh, because it's the, the way the uh, salary bill is going to shoot up. That's in April. You can change it. It's not too late to change, but you can change it, apart from the industrial relations issues. Uh, GMP renovation, I think so. I think I'm going to skip that. It's too dreadful. And automatic enrolment tests uh, are, they're changing, they're trying to simplify what scheme is eligible so that you don't have to auto-enroll people. And you just need to know that those are there. Those are some techie things. But it's just, I have to tell you, there are roughly 80,000 pages of regulations in pensions. And every year, there's another 2,000 pages of regulations on pensions alone. And life's too short to read all this stuff. <laughs> right, where are we up to? Uh, this is Gordon Brown with his pension and a guy called Adair Turner uh, who wrote a paper recently who was head of the Financial Conduct Authority and he's looking at his pension. About that big. What should we do? We need to, to take account of what government's thinking is in relation to pensions policy. It's, it's, it's not articulated but we all know what it is and that is we don't really care about second order pensions. If you want to care that's fine. So if you're writing for the firm a retirement income strategy it's sensible to bear that in mind. Second of all, if you haven't auto enrolled, don't wait around till the last possible minute. Do it now because the fines and everything, and it's complicated and it's difficult. And there's lots of forms to fill in and papers work to do. Just, just do it. And the reason is that the regulator, if they can find a reason for fining you, they will fine you. So just don't do it. And the sums are, are chunky, up to 10 grand a day. So let's not go there. Uh, high earners are really struggling at the moment. I know uh, most of us here are high earners, so it's self-interest. Uh, are there alternatives? Yes, there are. They're not quite developed yet. They're coming through the system, but there are things called unfunded systems, which the Swedes and the Germans have had for nearly six, 70 years, and they will solve a lot of these problems once they're available. So just keep an eye out for those. Um, and of course, people want to work on past 65 or 60, whatever the retirement age is. And that's a kind of partial solution to the problem. Uh, and the final thing is you've got closed, most, most of us in this room, I think, have probably got a relationship with a closed uh, defined benefit scheme. Most, most of them are closed. Is there a way of getting rid of that? You just, it's just one of the things you want to put in the retirement strategy that at the moment, because discount rates are so low, it's just too expensive. But that will change at some stage. And uh, there are in interim alternatives and there are future alternatives to getting rid of all those difficult to manage and expensive to manage pension schemes. Uh, before we finish, I just want to mention that the way we look at pensions is idiosyncratic in the United Kingdom. But there are general principles which apply across the world. I just want to show a clip uh, from a Norwegian uh, pension uh, this is an ad uh, for pensions uh, out off the Norwegian television. Uh, I hope it doesn't shock anybody. If you're, a, if you're of a nervous disposition, uh, please don't watch it. I am what I am. I am my own special creation. So come take a look. Give me the hook or the ovation. It's my world that I want to have. Not a place I have to hide in. Life's not worth a damn till you can say, I am what I am. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Duncan. We're done. Thanks. Can we have the can we, can we have the lights up? Uh, We've got time for yeah. questions. Yeah.
Yes, so if anybody's got questions for Robin, I notice Twitter's gone a bit mad about his comments about children and how many children we <laughs> 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 No pressure. Yes, I can yeah. see um, lady, lady Jeanette lady. has got a question in the middle. If you could say who you are and where you're from um, when you ask a question, it will be helpful. Thank you. Hi, Jeanette Makings from Close Brothers. Robin, what's your view for the very small companies, sort of less than 20 employees, on contractual enrolment as an alternative to auto enrolment? You'll have to explain the difference to me. Well, in, instead of going through the auto enrolment, well, sorry, right. to a lawyer. Yeah, go for it, yeah. <laughs> um, no, we, we, everyone uses jargon in a different way, but go for it. Um, yeah. Basically, as, as they enter employment, they are put into a pension scheme right. at a certain rate. And oh, I see, rate. auto, okay. Yeah. Um, right, <laughs> I'll try and do this quickly. Uh, if it's come, uh, uh, I'm a huge. I'm, I'm going to get. I'm going to lose the, the approval. Of, if there was any approval in this room, I'm about to lose it. Uh, I was a huge admirer of Mrs. Thatcher, but she did one dreadfully stupid thing, which would remove the right of employers to force people into pension schemes, and she did it for uh, reasons which I understand. But it was a big mistake. Now we've gone back 180 degrees to to forcing people into pension schemes, and if you've got a decent pension scheme, you should, in my opinion, depending on your what the policy of the company is, and obviously if you put everybody in, uh, it's expensive. Uh, but I think it's a very sensible thing to put them in. An auto enrolment is cheap and cheerful. It doesn't really apply to really... Uh, for, for most earners over 25,000 a year, it's not going to give them anything, the, auto, the basic auto enrolment basis. Uh, so if, if your company wants to do that, it's a very good thing. Um, th this is not a chat-up line, but my office is exactly next door to your office. And if you want a coffee, very happy to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to explore it. We're in Crown, Crown Place. You're in Crown Place too. Yeah. OK. Have we got another question from the audience? Go on, go for it, guys. No, I, th I think you've stunned them to silence, right. Robin. Thank you very much. Thanks, Debbie. OK.